Today, we are talking all about the verbal operants. Um, one of the most important parts of our field that can also sometimes get confusing and what you might want to teach in what order. Now, I remember when I first started out um, programming for ABA programs, and I had such a hard time understanding what the difference was between if I say clap your hands, if I clap my hands and need them to copy, or if I ask them what they're doing and they're clapping their hands. And I had such a hard time understanding what the difference was between if I'm telling them to clap their hands, if I'm showing them clapping my hands, or if I'm asking them what they're doing. And really that's all about the verbal operands. And the more I learned about it, the more I understood that language is not just about the words that we're saying, but there are so many components to language that affect how we're using words, how we're understanding words, and not just words, but actions and images and how, how we absorb all that information and how we teach it to our students. So what are the verbal operants? There's um, you know, a few verbal operants. Uh, Skinner, way back in his 1954 book called Verbal Behavior, please, it's a really hard read. He, uh, he writes on and on and on and on about these. And you know, without Skinner, it wouldn't have, you know, we wouldn't have had this field. But uh, let me save you the time and just review these really quickly instead of you having to read a big book that's really thick. Um, anyways, what are the verbal operants? The basic verbal operants are, you know, echoic, um, manned, receptive, which is also referred to as listener responding, uh, tacting, which can be expressive, introverbal, um, autoclitic. Some people also refer to a visual match to sample as a verbal operant. So what do all these mean? Whew. Let's start with echoic. You know, what does echoic mean? Echoic really just means verbal imitation. Can they copy your voice? Can they echo you back? That's what echoic means. And if any of you, um, you know, have had your own children or have worked with, you know, that one and a half year old age, their language is almost all echoic. As kids are learning language when they're like, you know, nine months, 12 months, 15 months, and they're starting to learn those first words, they'll always be repeating something after you. You say mama, they say mama. You say dada, they say dada. And that's how language starts is they're starting to copy the world around them. Um, and that's an echoic. Uh, the next verbal operant is a manned. Um, a manned is a request really quite simply request. Um, and it is really your, your basic, um, I want this, I want that. They don't need to say, I want. A man can be as simple as pointing to an item, reaching for an item. Have you ever had you know a student who grabs your hand and leads you towards something? Or have your own child who may give you something because they want you to open it or they want you to do something with it so that they can have it back. That is a man. And a man can be as simple as, like I said, giving an object to another person because they need you to open it. It, um, or reaching for an item because they want it, or it can be more complex. Like, uh, may you please pat me? May, may you please pass the salt? I really want it on my French fries. That is also a manned. So there's a lots of different forms of requesting, um, but just think manned equals request. And it's also the next phase of language development as kids are getting older and moving into the 18 months and two years old, they're telling you what they want. They want their milk. They want their ball. They want their toys. Um, and that's them learning to get their needs met through manding. And it's a very important skill for all people, all kids, especially the kids that we work with who sometimes don't know how to get their needs met. Um, a man could be verbal. It could also be using a picture, a sign, an AAC, a speech generating device. Any one of those things qualify as a man. And what's really great about a man is that just simply asking for something and getting something is reinforcing. You don't need any type of external motivator. You don't need to say, wow, great job. You asked for the cookie, blah, blah, blah. It's no, like you asked for the cookie, here's the cookie. So, you know, usually, you know, if a student has some echoic language and then they ask for something, that man in and of itself is reinforcing. So typically children will learn man's very quickly, or they'll learn how to request as one of those first verbal operants. Um, you know, another verbal operant is receptive or what some people refer to as listener responding. And receptive is simply, you know, following a direction. So whether that be clap your hand, hands or stand up or come here, or it could be even pointing to flashcards on the table, show me the apple or go get your shoes, that type of thing. Those are all receptive or listener responding. They don't require any type of verbal output. They just require some type of 
response. So we know that you were listening to me and you're understanding me because you're responding. Yeah. And this, the receptive language really comes next. Very often children understand a lot more than they're able to express and that's okay. Um, receptive language is showing us how much they can understand. Are our words meaningful to them? Can they follow instructions? Is it one step or two step instructions? Can they identify pictures? Can they discriminate? Um, all of those things fall into receptive language. Tacting is the next one. Uh, tacting is really expressive language. And you don't necessarily need to be verbal to tact because you can also tact through sign language. And what does tact is, is really, you know, when shown a picture of something, so if I'm showing a picture of an apple and I say, what is it? Can I say apple or can I sign apple? That is a tact. Um, a tact is also if I hold up a picture of, say, a broom and I say, what do you sweep with? And a student says broom, that they're looking at the picture of broom, that's also a tact. So the way I think about it is I think about expressive, but with a picture. And that's tacting. Now, I'm going to kind of move on here. So some people who have an augmentative communication device, so something like a speech generating device or picture symbols, and that's how they communicate, um, you know, we try and teach them tacting with that. So we may hold up a picture and say, what is it? And they have to go into their device and say, Apple. Um, now, I would consider that a tact. But a lot of people would consider that what we call a match to sample, um, because really all they're doing is they're looking at their device for that same picture or a similar picture on their device and they're matching to that sample. So you could call it a tact. You could call it a match to sample. My point is that, you know, if you've got somebody who's using a speech generating device, what I love about that is that they are actually using the device for more than just requesting or manding. So anyways, going back to what a tact is, if someone who is verbal, um, a tact is really expressive language when they're looking at a picture. And I think part of what, you know, the verbal operands serve is what function is the language serving? So if someone's using a speech, speech generated device and it's serving the function of them, them labeling something, then that would be a tact. So what function is this language serving? And that's how we know what verbal operand it falls into. Um, now, in addition to tacting, the next level of expressive language is intraverbal. Um, what an introverbal is, is it's this it's answering questions, having conversations. And the difference between a tact and an introverbal is with an introverbal, there is no um there's no picture. You're not just labeling something, you're coming up with the information without that image to support it or without that, you know, card or word or picture. Um, so an introverbal could be, what's your name? Um, and you're being able to answer your name or how are you good or basic fill-ins, right? Twinkle, twinkle, little, if they say star, that's an introverbal. There is no correspondence between your question and their response. It's, it's a completely, you know, different response to what you're showing them or presenting to them in the SD. Um, and that's an introverbal. And that, that's really when students are ready to start those, beginner conversation skills where they have a strong enough receptive and tact vocabulary where they can start answering questions. WH questions very often fall into the introverbal category. They could talk about themselves, have conversations. Um, those are all introverbal skills. So Shira, so many times in an ABA program, I've seen people just want to try and check off that introverbal, like check, okay, they can do introverbals. And, you know, you look at the H section of the ABLES and there's a lot of really great ideas in there. Um, but somebody will say, oh, I'm doing H, whatever the number is. I'm going to teach when questions um, because they need it on the introverbal so that I can check off this box. And that's a whole other side story about why do we don't want to check off a box in an assessment. But um, my point to that is, is that you can't just teach introverbals because because you're teaching kids to memorize without any conceptual understanding. So if I say, you know, I'm going to teach them when questions and, you know, my students really good at memorization, you know, when do you do this? When do you do that? When do you do this? Maybe why questions? Why do you eat? Because I'm hungry. Why do you sleep? Because I'm tired. Why do you drink? Because I'm thirsty, blah, blah, blah. You can teach these kids to memorize a whole bunch of answers. Um, and that We'll check off a section on the assessment for you, um, but there's no conceptual understanding there. You know, I oftentimes I see these kids in these ABA programs really trying to just check off a box of, yep, I've got some introverbals, um, but they truly don't understand. And that's sometimes why you get some scripting or you get some scrolling of responses, right? So if I say, you know, why do you sleep? And a student really doesn't understand because they're just being taught to memorize these 
they're going to go through their vocabulary of things that they've been taught in the past. So why do you sleep? Because I'm hungry, because I'm tired, because I'm thirsty, because I'm tired, because that's what they're trying to, you know, that that's what they've been taught. Um, so anyways, uh, our suggestion would be when we're teaching these verbal operants, and when you get to that intraverbal level, number one, make sure they have that true receptive understanding first. Make sure that you're teaching that receptive and that expressive, right? The tacting with the picture before you teach that intraverbal, because they need to have that knowledge and that background. Um, you know, I can't ask, you know, a neurotypical three year old or a, a four year old about, you know, um, um, I don't know, space, if they've never learned about the planets or anything like that. But if, if I've gone through a planet book with them and we've talked about all the planets and then I ask them questions about it without the picture, then they're able to answer. So think about that as well, um, making sure that, you know, your students have been taught that in a different format before you go on to the interverbals. And this is why we talk very often about teaching across operants, because it's not enough to teach any of these operants in isolation. It's not about teaching, you know, filling all the receptive boxes and then filling all the taxing boxes and then moving on to introverbals. Um, we often talk about if you're teaching one question as well, within one program, you can have them match one questions, you can have them receptively identify one question, you can have them tax questions, and then you can have them answer questions, answer one questions. And so if you do all of that within one program, it really helps them to conceptualize, well, I'm answering a one question and I understand what I'm answering because we also talked about it, we looked at pictures about it, um, and then it really helps support that introverbal language. So it will change what we're collecting the data on. We may start by collecting the data on the receptive and just doing the tacting and the introverbal just for good practice, and then moving on to collecting the data on the introverbal ultimately. But teaching across operands really helps them conceptualize all these operands of language so that introverbals don't just become a memorized skill. And sometimes tacting is the same. It's not enough for them to just memorize, you know, where do you take a shower in the bathroom? If they don't understand what the bathroom looks like, what else is in the bathroom, the category of a bathroom and, and where to find their bathroom, right? So all of those things are part of a good ABA program is when you can incorporate all the operants within teaching, you know, an important skill. Language is complex. And, you know, go back and going back to Skinner's book, you know, Skinner says you can't really know what an item is until you're able to experience all of it. So, you know, you take the example of shower and bathroom. You need to know, you know, that a shower is found in a bathroom along with a toilet and along with a sink. And a shower is for taking showers because you're dirty. And usually you take showers in the morning or maybe you take showers at night or maybe you only take showers after three days uh, when you're really stinky, um, but you really need to know all of that before you can answer the question, why do you take a shower or when do you take a shower? So really, you know, incorporating that into your programming and making sure that you have all of those verbal operants covered when you're writing a program. Um, so the last verbal operant that we'll talk about is one called an autocletic. And this is one that I remember years ago being asked about in an interview and I had no idea what it was. <laughs> so I did make sure to know what it is for this podcast recording. Um, it's really about giving information about other parts of the sentence. So I think that it's warm outside today or, um, you know, that that phrase before that gives the rest of the sentence, gives you information about what's happening in the rest of the sentence. I'm a hundred percent sure that the sun is shining right now because I'm looking at it. So that hundred percent qualifies the rest of the sentence that I am certain about what I'm talking about. You know, if I think that it might be cold outside, I really don't know if it's cold outside. I'm qualifying the sentence by saying, eh, I think that maybe um, that's what an autoclitic is. Typically don't teach that until a child has a ton of language. And oftentimes kids will just pick those up on their own. And it's really cute sometimes when I actually hear that. Um, I've been talking to students, you know, we're talking and, you know, we're talking about interverbals, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, a student says to me, well, actually, <laughs> I love it because, you know, actually can be an introvert or an autoclitic. And I go, wow, yay, language for free. Um, or they say, well, potentially blah, 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 blah. And, you know, then you listen to their parents and their parents say the word potentially or actually quite often. And that's when you start to smile because you say, wow, they're really generating language on their own without being taught. And it's so, so nice. 
So now that we've talked about what the operands are, um, what is the best way to work on these? What do we teach first? What's the order for teaching operands? So we kind of, you know, talked about how echoics are those first signs of language that a child will learn. Usually developmentally, they'll start by imitating the language around them, and that's an echoic. Um, so if a child has any language, there it's likely to be somewhat echoic. They're able to imitate. So then you want to build up their echoic rep repertoire, get them to imitate more sounds, get them to make more words. If they're making, you know, certain sounds build up to new sounds. Um, this can always, of course, be in conjunction with the speech pathologist who can help you understand which echoics to work on. Um, from there, we'll often build up a mandating repertoire because what, like Shana said, it's, it's reinforcing. If they can learn to ask for what they want, then the reinforcement is inherent in them using their words. Once they can learn that their language is meaningful, that it gets them what they want. And that's really the best reinforcement for language. If they can learn that when I point, gesture, sign, talk, any one of those things, I get what I want. That's super meaningful and reinforcing. It's going to be the easiest way to start. So building up that manding repertoire and give them as many ways to get their needs met as possible. You know, and there's no true formula on this that once students have X number of mans, then you should teach receptive language. Typically, we're teaching across operants all the time. So in any ABA program, you know, we are doing echoics and we're doing manding and we're building up on receptive language all at the same time. Um, but the next order of teaching, if I had to put an order in it would be that receptive, right? So it would be now starting to build on what can you conceptually understand? So if you are manding for Apple, I'm going to assume that you know what an Apple is because you're asking for it and you get it. Um, but at the same time, I still want to test it. So I'm still going to put it out on the table and I'm going to say, show me the Apple. Um, and usually if someone can mand for an Apple, they can typically um, point to an Apple and show me what that Apple is. Not always, but usually. Um, other receptive repertoire, you know, things like I said before, sit down, come here, uh, stop, wait. Those are all, you know, those um, beginner uh, direction following that I would start to teach a student. And then once a student has a receptive language, then you can start teaching some tacting. So if a student is already requesting verbally and using that vocal language, um, tacting can come. So, you know, at the same time, I'm teaching, I'm teaching manding. So I'm saying, uh, or the student's saying, I want apple or apple or cookie or an approximation of cheese or whatever that they want. I'm always saying food, but it could be an activity as well. You know, then I'm going to have them identify some of those and make sure they can do it. Then I can also hold up objects, pictures, and say, what is it? Um, sometimes I don't say, what is it? I just hold up the picture and get them to label it so that I can get that tact. And that's what um, an ABA program is. That would be the order is like echoic, then manding, then receptive, then tact, and then later on introverbal. Um, let me tell you a quick story. Uh, when I was younger, uh, this was like 20, 25 years ago, getting into ABA, um, there wasn't a lot of research on manding. I mean, Skinner had said it ages ago, um, but the current train of thought was, well, you only teach receptive and expressive language. So if a student, the 20 years ago, we said, well, if a student can't ask for things, it's because they don't understand it. So let's just teach receptive language and tacting. And then the student will just talk and, and that'll be great. And we never taught requesting. We just missed it. We never taught that manding. And lo and behold, many students couldn't mand. They couldn't get their needs met. And that was really horrible ABA. I, I, like we just didn't know any better. Um, obviously, you know, the verbal behaviorists have come out and lots and lots of research has been done that says, you know, if you've got receptive and expressive, there's nothing to say that they can, you know, that receptive leads to manding. And there's nothing to say that tacting leads to manding. However, there's a lot of research that says manding leads to receptive and manding leads to tact. So keep that in mind in any ABA program, there must, must, must be manding all the time. Even if a student is older, even if a student has lots of language, making sure that they can mand even for attention, appropriate protest, manding for WH questions, et cetera. Um, but as you're building up that receptive and expressive language, don't just automatically assume like I did 20, 25 years ago, that that's going to lead to requesting because it's not. Yeah. And that's a really good point because we can often use the operant 
previous to the one we're teaching to help support it. So like the manned to TAC transfer or an echoic to man transfer, um, the ones that come before usually are a great way to support moving them through the verbal operand. So for example, if a child has echoics and you want to teach them to man, so they're able to imitate ball, but you want them to ask for a ball, you can do an echoic to man transfer, get them to imitate it and then get them to, to ask for it. Um, you could do the same thing with a man to tack transfer, any one of those things where they're they they need the step before to help support it, and then you can move them on to the next one. Um, so that's a great way to move students through the operants while teaching across operants, which is what we often talk about. So uh, here, let's demonstrate what an echoic to man transfer is, because oftentimes I see people miss some key steps here and it ends up just being an echoic and not a mand. And then people are saying, my student can't mand and I'm not sure how to make the mand. Um, so an echoic to man transfer, what that means, like Shira said, is echoic to mand. So using the example of a ball, we know the student wants the ball at that particular time. They can imitate me saying ball. So I say ball, they say ball. I say, wow, great. What do you want? Or what? Or something along that line. If they say ball, that is an echoic to mand transfer because they've said ball after I've said what? Or what do you want? Or huh? or waited a little bit longer. Now, if I just said ball and they say ball and I give them the ball, that's not a man, that's an echoic. So you do have to make sure that you're getting that transfer trial in of, huh, what? So after I've done, I've set up the verbal imitation, that echoic, right? Ball, they say ball. I go back and I do it one more time and get that step so that it's the presence of the ball that evokes the verbal stimuli of ball versus me saying ball and they say ball. Yeah, and this is the, you know, the transfer trial is such an important part of moving students through these verbal operands. The same thing with, you know, attack to intraverbal transfer. If you're teaching a student, you know, where do you sleep and you have a picture of a bed and they're able to say bed, that's attacked. And so if you're doing a program where you want them to be able to answer that without the picture, so you may show them the picture, where do you sleep? And they look at the picture and they say bed and they tacked. There needs to be a transfer trial in between. If you ask them the question again without the picture, where do you sleep? Then they say bed, that's an intraverbal. Um, so you did prime them before with, with the picture. So, you know, you're still, they're not, you know, purely mastering intraverbals, but it is a good way to support moving them through these operands is using the previous one, the picture, the image, the, the echoic, um, to help support that errorless learning so that they can move through those operands. And that's called attack to intraverbal transfer. We use it all the time. Sometimes I teach kids phone numbers, right? And I'll write their phone number down on a piece of paper and I'll say, what's your phone number? And then we backward fade it, right? So it's script fading, um, you know, backwards to forwards. So my phone number is blah, 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 blah. And then I fade out that last number. Then I fade out the last two numbers, et cetera. I mean, really that's attack to intraverbal transfer as well because they're still looking at the picture and eventually I'm going to fade that picture out. So script fading can also be attack to intraverbal transfer and a really good way to teach some of these operants. And those are better ways to support the intraverbal and tact repertoires than verbal prompting. So if you're always, if they're always relying on you saying their phone number and then re them repeating it after you, um, it's much better for you to use script fading or prompting using visuals to support that because then you're relying on the tacting repertoire and not the echoic, right? So you're only moving back one step and then they're able to, to move it forward much better and they're not as dependent on that verbal prompting. So, you know, I get the question a lot of like, well, what happens if my child or my client isn't making progress? What do I do? Um, really at that point in time, you have to analyze where the breakdown is and teach from there. So for instance, you know, if we say, you know, my child, my, my client isn't manding, you know, what do I do? Well, that's when I'm going to look at the transfer. I'm going to see, is there transfer trials? Are you doing a proper echoic to man transfer? Or are you just stopping at that echoic stage? You know, if a student isn't generalizing or isn't um, learning their intraverbals because they're scrolling, the first thing I'm going to look at is to make sure that they have that solid, you know, receptive and tacting repertoire, because if they don't, I'm going to start there. Um, if they do and they just can't get that intraverbal, I'm going to see whether or not we can do a tact to intraverbal transfer. 
However, I'm going to pause on that. Um, I had a student one time, a few students who couldn't get into verbals. We had done everything. We'd done a solid background. We've done transfer trials, everything else. And then sure, I looked at their age. They were three and a half years old, um, four years old. And that makes a huge difference. You know, um, Sunberg created a whole list of questions. It's, you know, part of the BBMAP package. Um, and you go through with, you know, kids and ask these questions. And you see, you know, in a mainstream classroom, even at a junior kindergarten level or preschool level, lots of kids can't answer these introverbal questions because they just can't do introverbals because of their age. So regardless of how much I have taught, a three and a half year old and how well my teaching is. Sometimes I just have to say they're not getting it because of their age, not because I've done poor teaching. Yeah, it's really important to consider the age, um, what's developmentally appropriate for some of our students, because some of them might be um, developmentally at a much younger age, so even though they might be older, it's not appropriate to be focusing so much on introverbals, um, what's functionally appropriate for them, and not feeling like we need to move students too quickly through these operands. Like what's going to be more important that they can follow two-step instructions and be able to, um, you know, do their routines independently or being able to memorize a whole bunch of WH questions. Um, I mean, memorizing is never what we want them to do, but it, there's nothing wrong with really focusing on that receptive and tact repertoires if that's what's going to be more functional for a student and not moving into the introverbals if that's not going to be appropriate for them um, or moving into it with lots of, you know, vid visual picture, text, script fading, a, a lot of that support um, and not feeling like, well, it's on the assessment, so we're going to need to teach it no matter what. Um, so really focusing on what's going to be functional and relevant for the students that we're teaching. So we've talked a lot about verbal operants today, and I know as you're listening to a podcast, you may be doing other things like washing the dishes or driving or focusing in on something else at the same time. So um, we have created a free verbal operants guide. So click the link on or around this video to get your free verbal operants guide um, to download all the verbal operants so that you can take a look at them later when you're referencing um, for programming. So we covered a lot today. We described all of the verbal operands. We defined them. We talked about how we'd use them, when we'd use them, how we teach them, what the teaching order is, um, and some of our tips and tricks to moving students through those operands and what to do if you might be stuck with a potential student within an operand. So to learn more about what are verbal operands, click on the link on or around this video to get your free verbal operands guide.